I think he's just joking. So, all right. In this session, we're going to talk about the customer journey to secure your identity infrastructure. Um, quick introduction about me. I thought it will be fun to include some personal pictures. Um, I'm a PM at Microsoft within the identity team. I've been in the identity team for five and a half years, have worked on multi-factor authentication, conditional access, identity protection. And earlier this year, I decided I wanted to drive adoption of security best practices. What we were seeing on our end is that we had all these features, conditional access, identity protection, that can block these attacks. But the problem was customers don't turn them on till it's too late. We'll often hear stories where a customer went through a breach. Next week, they have all the security best practices turned on. <laughs> so how do we move the customers from being reactive to proactive was the challenge I took up. So I've been working on features like identity secure score, working on baseline protection, making it super simple to turn on these security capabilities, turning them on by default, making sure we integrate well with Microsoft security story as well as Azure security story. So those are some of the things I drive within the team. Uh, personally, I love travel and I love outdoors. So um, on the left, can you guess where this place is? Sorry, it's Iceland, Reykjavik. So I recently took a trip to Iceland and uh, the Nordic countries, and um, that's one of the pics from there. And on the right is the very familiar Mount Rainier. So I had the opportunity to climb Rainier this summer. So those are the two adventures that I really um, cherish this year. The next one that's coming up is I'm going to Kenya and Tanzania in December with my sister. So any tips from you guys are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> there are no windows in the safari cars, I heard. So <laughs> I heard don't just keep your body in the vehicle is what I heard. Don't like put your neck out or hands up. Yeah, that's also a good tip. Thank you. All right, moving on to what we are here to talk about, which is I want to make folks aware of the top three identity attacks that we see as Microsoft. Second, I want to um, share how you can prevent against those attacks, what we call the security best practices. And lastly, the goal is to hear feedback from the room as well on, hey, do you guys agree with these best practices? What are the challenges that you see when talking to your customers about deploying these best practices? So channel all the feedback to me so I can go back to Redmond and then tomorrow itself I can be like, hey, we need to build these capabilities to actually drive adoption of security. Me or Pam? Both of us are from the no team. No <laughs> All right, so the top three attacks. We are in a room of very smart people. Who wants to take a guess except Pam? Pass the hash maybe? Not on the list, but yes, those are about. Yeah, phishing. Yes, you got phishing. Yes, password spray. One more, one more. What do you think of it? Yeah, brute force is there, but it's not on that list. All right, so password spray is one of the top most attacks that we see. The second one is phishing, like you, everybody guessed. The third one is breach replay, which um, I'll talk more details about as we go through the presentation. How many of you are familiar with breach replay? I know no one guessed it, but. OK, great. You learned something new today. And, ju and just to be clear, this, these are the top three attacks that you're seeing in Azure, not necessarily an on-prem environment. We're, these are the top three attacks that we see as Microsoft on Azure AD as well as on the consumer side. So password spray attack. Someone said password spray. I think this gentleman here said password spray. Did you? What is password spray? Hundred percent correct. <laughs> you get extra popcorns. <laughs> um, but really, that's what that's how simple password free attack is, right? We all tend to use common passwords, um, and bad attack uh, bad actors are aware of these common passwords and they try it against our systems. You would expect it's hard for them to crack these passwords, but based on the telemetry we see on both consumer and enterprise side, 
one out of 100 accounts fall prey to password spray. So if you try a common password against 100 accounts, you're likely to get one, is the data we see on our systems. So this is what password spray attack looks like to us. So every color here indicates a common password that's, that's played on our system. So we see a common password played against our system many, many, many times. There are a bunch of these common passwords that these guys are trying. These are the most common passwords that we saw in September 2018. So everyone here was in PAM stock, right? Yeah. And everyone here was awake, right? So uh, Pam had a common password on her slide. Which one was that? It was September 2018, exclamation mark. Something like that, right? Anyone else? It was three. Summer is the right word. Oh, summer. Summer. David? <laughs> All right. Um, so summer 2018 was what uh, Pam had in her slides. And this is what we are seeing on our system, that users are using words like summer, fall, September, London, and so on. And that's all because of our password policies. We'll go into more detail as we go through the presentation. How common is password spray? And this is data just on the Azure AD side. We saw that in September 2018, 208,000 accounts were compromised due to password spray. This is just Azure AD. And for us to detect password spray, we need to be able to see all the failed attempts. So customers who are federated, we don't see password spray attack for them. So these are all customers that are using Azure AD, and this is the badness we are detecting. Multiply that with like if we were to detect it for federated customers, the numbers are going to be much, much larger. Primarily, these attacks are coming from legacy authentication. I know someone mentioned that yesterday. So the sad part about being the last presenter of the conference is a lot of your slides and content is gone. So I know um, someone yesterday mentioned that primarily uh, attacks are coming from legacy authentication. And I'll deep dive into how can you approach blocking legacy authentication in your environment. So how do you protect against password spray? The first recommendation we have in this list is to ban common passwords. How many of you were in the Azure AD password protection presentation yesterday? So you know all about it, right? <laughs> and you're probably testing this feature already. So if you are using Azure AD, we do this by default within our system. So if you use cloud-only accounts, we make sure you don't use a common password. If you're, you, if you're a hybrid customer, which most of our customers are, uh, we have brought this capability to on-premises. So now you can apply band password filter to on-prem. So this is what the new capability looks like. The next thing I want to touch on is changing your password policy. So if you remember, we saw words like summer, fall in the common password list. And that's because most organizations have a 90-day password expiration policy. When you have a 90-day expiration policy, what you do is you just pick seasons, right? That's the easiest way. Summer, fall, spring, winter. Got you covered. And then added the year, and then add an excl exclamation mark. You don't have to remember passwords anymore. You have a pattern that you think works really well for you, and bad actors know about it, and they play it against our systems. So it's our password policies that are pushing our end users into predictable behavior. Things like expiring password every 90 days, Microsoft recently changed the password expiration to one year. So we used to have 90 days. We changed it to one year internally. The second thing is password complexity, forcing the end user to have alphabets, numbers, special characters. Doesn't help because it, again, pushes the user to have predictable behavior. For instance, the summer 2018 exclamation mark is a perfect example of a predictable behavior where you start with S, capital, because the password complexity policy forces you to have capital. And we all know capital has to be at the first place. And then you have the word summer, because you have to change every 90 days. And then you need some numbers. So you pick the year, or your birth date, or whatever number you like. And then you have exclamation mark at the end, because you need a special character to actually satisfy your password policy. Sometimes you replace A with at. Sometimes you replace O with zero. So that's how you actually go and beat those password policies, which is not helping end users, which is not helping organizations. It's actually hurting them. 
because they have this false sense of security that, hey, I have a complex policy and then users are secure. That's not true. So our recommendation then, NIST has validated this as well, is to not expire passwords, make sure you get rid of the complexity rules, ban all the common passwords. The second recommendation to protect against password spray is to block suspicious IPs. If you're a cloud customer, again, it's automatic, so nothing to worry about, do nothing. If you're a hybrid customer who uses cloud authentication with Azure AD, again, this is automatically done for you. Now, if you're a federated customer, we recently introduced what we call the risky IP report in Azure AD Connect Health, which gives you all the IP addresses that you're seeing bad attempts from. So you can take these list of IP addresses that we're seeing badness from and then block them in your ADFS client access rules as well as in Azure AD conditional access. Only for uh, bad attempts on your tenant or on Just your tenant. It's what Azure AD Connect Health has detected within your tenant. The next recommendation, which we're going to drill deeper into, is to block legacy auth. As I mentioned, majority of our password spray attacks are coming from legacy auth. So if you block legacy auth, you don't have to worry about password spray. You can reduce your attack surface by almost 66%. So password spray <laughs> and block legacy auths. We talk to customers about blocking legacy auth, and the first thing they tell me is they can't do it. It's super challenging because they have execs using the native mail clients. They have Thunderbird clients. They have other pop, IMAP, all the SMTP clients out there. So it does seem impossible at first, but you just need to stay calm and slowly start approaching the problem. So the first thing you need to do is to understand the legacy auth usage within your environment. And we have added a bunch of capabilities in Azure AD and other products might have similar things that you can leverage, where um, within the sign-in report, we tell you what client app was used. So within the sign-in report, you can see if the user was using an SMTP client or an IMAP client or a POP and so on. Now you can take that information and aggregate it on your end to figure out the users that are using these legacy clients. You can also figure out the apps that are using the legacy clients. We have further simplified it. So we recently integrated with Azure Log Analytics, and we built some pre canned views where you can see the legacy auth usage within Azure Log Analytics. So the first chart here shows you legacy auth usage within your organization, in addition to the users that are using legacy auth. So there's a question. Uh, yeah. In Azure AD Domain Services and DLM is enabled by default. That's actually a thread on this um, that I'm having with my manager and a bunch of folks within our team where uh, we want to have some recommendations around NTLM insecure score as well as a security white paper. Yes, it's a problem. Azure AD Domain Services and DLM enabled by default. There is a discussion about how do we educate customers about NTLM and how do we tell them that they should disable it. But this is a commercial service. It can't yeah. that's, the that's also a good point. We should turn it off by default. So we are, we are going to meet later this week to discuss this issue. Um, it's timely. So the next thing you want to do is once you understand the users that have legacy authentication within your organization, just create a group, put them in a group, call it legacy auth users. And then the next thing you do is to create a conditional access policies to block everyone except the users in the group. So this is the easy part. You know um, Gil is not using legacy auth. Let's go ahead and block legacy auth for Gil. So take all the users except the legacy auth user group and block legacy auth for them. Quick win. Now let's focus on the hard problem, which is what do we do about these legacy auth users? <laughs> um, you want to next understand the client apps that they are using, right? It all boils down to the app. So having to understand, are they using the old um, mail client? Are they using Office 2010? 
or so on. So just building an inventory of all the apps that are being used by this legacy auth user group. Next, come up with a plan to upgrade the client. So I've put in the slide some clients that support modern auth, but um, you'll have to look at a client by client client basis and figure out what's the best replacement for the end users. So if uh, a user is using the native mail client, you might have to ask them to up, uh, use Outlook Mobile or use the latest version of iOS, which then supports modern art. So looking at your inventory of apps, you'll have to come up with solutions for each of the apps. And continue monitoring usage and keep removing users from the legacy auth users group. That's not where it ends. <laughs> So we thought we blocked legacy auth for users in conditional access. That's great. Unfortunately, that's not enough. Um, what conditional access does is, is it blocks legacy auth post the authentication. So we have validated the username and password. And post that, we decided to block the user because of the policy. What you want to do is to block the user pre-auth. And that you can do with an exchange. So in exchange, you can block certain protocols. So um, you really want to block those protocols pre-auth, and that way the users are not locked out. Because what you'll observe is when password spray attacks are happening in your organization, users are getting locked out. And they're not able to get work done, and they're calling help desk. So to prevent that problem, you want to block legacy auth, pre-auth as well, in addition to post-auth using conditional access. Next attack, phishing. Most folks know about it. Anyone wants to define it? Gil. Oh, sending emails to people that are convincing them to go to a malicious website and enter credentials that they think are for one website that are actually being sponsored by somebody else. Perfect. Um, I don't have a slide defining it because I thought everyone knew it. Um, there are some hidden slides that you can look at if you want a definition, but Gil is perfectly right. So the first thing you want to do to prevent phishing is to monitor the risky behavior within your organization. So within Azure AD, we have the notion of risky users and risky sign-ins. You want to keep an eye on those reports, see if you're seeing any high-risk users within your environment, and then investigate them further, reset password if they are actually high-risk users with their accounts compromised. Uh, on the right is a snapshot of the security dashboard that will be available in the next few weeks, where in addition to just going to the report and deep diving, it provides you a high level overview of what's going on in your organization. So here, for the last 90 days, I can see what's the pattern for risky users, risky sign-ins. And if I see anomalies, like in the middle, I see suddenly I have a spike of users that are getting risky, I should go take an action immediately. So it gives you a good overview of what's going on in your organization. and. Um, one of the feedback I heard from some customer who's not here anymore is it's sometimes hard to justify the value of identity protection to our management because um, we can't send them that Excel file with lots of users and lots of sign-ins. So uh, they are having to build their own dashboards. So this will mitigate the need for some of that where it gives you a dashboard out of the box that you can go show to your management that this is the value that I'm getting out of identity protection. Any questions? Everyone is familiar with identity protection? Yeah? Great. So the next thing you want to do is to enable a sign and risk policy. So when we see phishing attempts, we are seeing that the user is coming from a new IP address or a new device or something suspicious is going on for that sign in. So we can mitigate that if you configure a sign-in risk policy. So when you have a sign-in risk policy, we can challenge that risky sign-in for MFA, or we can outright block that sign-in based on your policy configuration. So as I said, we can protect against risky sign-ins. You can configure this based on the risk level. So going back to what Michael was saying, you want to have <laughs> Sorry for getting you <laughs> at the wrong time. So Michael was talking about how you want to have some way of detecting the user risk. And what you want out of that system is not necessarily numbers like 400, which means nothing to you, right? Is 400 good, bad? What is it out of? Instead, you want something which is like high, medium, low, which gives you a great indication of am I doing well or not? So within identity protection, we give you risk levels, high, medium, low, um, which indicates the severity of how critical that risky sign-in is. 
The next thing, controls. Um, there are two options. You can require multi-factor authentication, which is actually the recommended approach because you don't want to get in the way of the user, right? You don't want to block them and impact their productivity. All you want to do is to challenge with multi-factor authentication, verify it's the actual user. They get in, the bad guy is stopped at that point. So multi-factor authentication is definitely the recommended option here. So to summarize, our recommended configuration is MFA for medium and above risk level. Any questions, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, is there a possibility to detect the phishing attack before it actually happens, before the, the attacker steals the, the credentials of the, of the user? So there are capabilities on the office side that can detect phishing attacks before the user clicks on that URL or clicks um, on that file. Um, but that only works on known phishing websites, right? Or can you detect like this website looks like outlook.access website, but it, it is not our outlook that actually It does look at URLs. Um, like we recently had a phishing campaign within Microsoft where um, we got an email saying, hey, go to this uh, link urgently, take action. And um, it was able to detect that this is a phishing attempt. And then you can report it from right in Outlook and um, say that this is a phishing attempt, and uh, then the security team is informed about it. That's a good question. I, I actually will have to follow up. I've seen it with Outlook um, I clients. With the actually opening the URL, yeah. 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 And, uh, I think this is the, not the safety feature of, of Office 365. So it replaces the link to the safety. And yeah. then in Office 365 ATP, it actually detonates the link in a VM and does a bunch of check, checking on the URL and the content that's there. So, so it's all server side and it will work irrespective of the client. Yeah, so the end user just gets the link into Office. Yeah. And then, then Office redirects the end user yeah. if it's a face of the service. I've observed it with client as well as OWA, but I wasn't 100% sure. Any other questions? No? The next one, breach replay. This is the one that folks didn't guess. So um, how may, many of you reuse passwords? Or never. Or used it in your past life, reused. <laughs> because that's very common. You reused it, and then you started working on identity security, and then you're like, oh no, this is really bad. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I got, so sure. but I got better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all of us are getting better. Um, but this problem is very common, especially outside this room, right? Like end users tend to reuse uh, username passwords. Um, let's take an example, right? If Gil has to plan a lunch for his team, and he has to now sign up for an account with OpenTable, let's assume. So what is Gil likely to do? He's going to use his email address, his work email address, because he's doing this lunch for work. And then he's going to reuse the same password, because who wants to remember yet another password, no, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's replace Gil with some other person. But um, that's really how end users respond, right? Like um, they tend to reuse the common uh, username passwords on websites. And what if that third party website gets breached and those username passwords are out there in the dark web? It's a matter of time. You pay a few cents for these credentials and play it against the enterprise, right? And this is super, super common. Like our data tells us we detected 6 million credentials this year. So we processed 2 billion credentials. And we actually found a match for 6 million of them. So that's how common breach replay is. It's yeah, it's an astonishing high number. <laughs> so how do you protect against breach replay? It's actually quick breach uh, so Dividing, it's yeah. Yeah, it's a lot bigger. Recently, we got a good batch because <laughs> Um, the numbers in August was 650K or something around 600-ish K. And then um, we got a good batch of credentials and 
the number really went up in a month. Um, so the first thing you can do is to turn on password hash synchronization. What that allows us to do is if we do find these credentials in the dark web, we can match it against the password hashes in Azure AD and tell you there's a match. So now you can go into Azure AD and reset password for that user. Even better is you have a policy, so we automatically prompt the user to change their password without even IT intervention. This is the number that I get surprised by. So uh, recently we did analysis on how many customers have password hash to sync. And the reason that we were doing this analysis is every time we talk to customers, they have pushback that, hey, I don't want to push my password hashes to the cloud because of security reasons. I don't want to uh, push those secrets to the cloud. Turns out 82% of Azure AD tenants have password hash sync enabled. That covers 57% of the Azure AD active users. So if we break down this number by um, the customer size, this is very high for the smaller customers. And then um, the numbers are around 40, 50% for the really large enterprises. But overall, it turns out to be 82% of our tenants. How many of you, actually, you had a question. I was just going to remark, isn't it ironic that they don't want to push the password hash to the cloud for security reasons, but yet that's making them less secure? And that's exactly the conversation we are having with the customers that if you turn password hash sync, you get the benefit of leak credentials. The second benefit that you get is having a disaster recovery plan. Um, we have had customers where the on-premises environment is completely wiped out. Um, because of WannaCry, and um, <laughs> and um, luckily one of the customers had password hash sync turned on a few weeks before that incident. They flipped over to cloud authentication, and they were back up and running like in days. You had a question. Well, as a counter to Dave's comment, have you considered providing your customers a tool to run on prem against their AD? We have not considered that. I want to say that. I thought you were referring to password filters. No, the password filter works for banned password. He's talking about leak credentials. Yeah, and they'll tell you if the, you have a leak credential in your AD. Yeah. Um, so as far as I know, we haven't considered it, but I, it could be that the someone else in the team has. So I'll take that feedback um, to the team. But to just play <laughs> devil's advocate, our strategy is to move customers to cloud, right? That's where. No. <laughs> did you? Oh, no. When, when did that happen? That's your strategy. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> moving on. So, <laughs> I think it's the industry strategy. Like, there's no point talking about how do I stay on premises anymore, right? Um, the next recommendation is to use the user risk policy, and um, this comes in play where we detect a leak credential for Gale, and then. If you have this policy configured, we can automatically prompt Gil to change his password on the next sign-in. So we detect it, we automatically prompt Gil to change his password, and within an hour, Gil's account is recovered, IT is not involved, and it's all good. So the way the password change works is uh, we first prompt the user for multi-factor authentication. So we verify that it's actually Gil, and then once they complete the MFA challenge, they can change their password. So it only works if you have the user registered for MFA. You don't need to turn on MFA. You just need to make sure they have MFA information on the account. And you're not verifying a skill. You're verifying a skill's phone. Exactly. I mean, that's the closest proxy we have. 
Um, if only we could take the DNA test and verify Gil, oh, that would be amazing. Um, so this policy remediates compromised users. So if we detect leak credential or we see tons of bad activity for the user, we can remediate their account. It is based on risk level, high, medium, low. High means we are very certain the user account is compromised, and these are just variations of our assurance. The next one is controls. So I suggested customers use password change because it provides you automatic remediation. The second option is to block the user, in which case the user will end up calling help desk. It's help desk cost, and then help desk will have to manually reset the password. And then there's a whole problem of social engineering where someone could tell help desk that, hey, it's me, and I'm not able to get work done. My boss is yelling at me, and can you please reset password, send it to my email? So there are those whole implications. So we recommend that you use password change. And we'll come back to you in a second. So our recommendation, just to summarize, is requiring password change on high-risk users. Back to you. Is there, a, is there a configuration where you can force MFA and then require a password change after the MFA? So that's okay. exactly what this password it's change exactly. does. By default, it does a secure password change. Right. And it requires MFA and then password change. We won't allow a simple right. yeah, okay. password change after we know your account is compromised. All right. I know someone talked about identity secure score yesterday. But I'll still talk about it as, because um, it's my feature. <laughs> Whoever talked about it doesn't matter. Um, but the intent here is, right, we want to get customers to a more secure posture. And we have been publishing this guidance um, through white papers, through customer conversations, and blogs. But it doesn't reach our customers. So what we've done is we have codified all our recommendations in what we call the Identity Secure Score. It provides you insights into your current security posture. So you can understand you are 50 out of 150. So you have an objective way to measure your security posture. And it also provides you guidance on how to increase your security level. So it, all the recommendations I talked about during the presentation are covered within the Identity Secure Score. These are all the recommendations. I'll quickly recap them, and you'll realize that most of what I talked about is actually codified in the Identity Secure Score. So you don't have to talk to me or anyone. You can just go to the Secure Score and understand what is Microsoft recommending and what is generally the industry recommending. So the first thing we want uh, customers to do is to enable MFA for Azure AD privileged roles. Um, guess percentage. what percentage of Azure AD privileged privilege privilege roles have MFA? 20. 20? Very optimistic. Very, very optimistic. Forty zero. Seven. It's just 6.341%. I wish that was the right answer. But the number is 1.7%. And it used and to be 1% one one four months ago, 0.7% a year ago. The number is the number just depressing. depressing. Um, this, um, is in spite this is in spite of all the guidance, so hopefully having this, having this in identity score, score, having a simple, having a simple, simple, baseline, simple baseline, baseline protection, protection policy would really help get more customers, more customers turned on with MFA for their app. That's what we are, thinking, what we are about. thinking about. What do you think, what do you think customers, will, customers think will think about it? They'll grumble for a little bit, and then they'll go up and they'll go Yeah. Yeah. That's our, That's approach, our approach as well, given, like, given we like we think MFA for Azure AD privilege is so critical because they control the entire organization that we want to start forcing multi-factor authentication on these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Do you charge separately for those? What? Do you charge separately for those? That is free. That is free. So, um, so um, baseline, baseline protection, protection is available to all Microsoft customers. customers. So there's no, there's no additional cost to turn on MFA paper. It covers global, it covers global admins, exchange admin, SharePoint admin, admin, admin conditional access admin, admin, and security admin. Uh, based, on uh, data, based on data, that covers, uh, that covers 99 percent of the admin roles that we see in Azure AD. 
There's a question. There's a question behind. I was just going to say it, it, it could probably go over well if you had a non-foam factor available in your MFA solution. For example. For example. There's lots of them. Ken had about six of them on her desk during her presentation. <laughs> so now, let, so me now let me follow that train, follow that train of thought. We enforce, we enforce this policy. This policy. And, and one point day you're prompted to register, to register for MFA, MFA. Okay. and then you don't and have, you don't have one, of those, one of those factors on you. I'm assuming you would have just Amazon overnighted them. <laughs> so, <laughs> the <mo> <laughs> so we know, so we know your address so, and so you can so your address. Pam was very convincing about A, how cheap they are, how easy they are to order off of Amazon. You guys can <laughs> that's exactly what we want customers to do. But if you enable something by default. If you signed up for an average subscription, send one over. Yeah. Just make it happen. It's seven bucks. <laughs> I will put I will that, put that feedback, feedback, in feedback in my trip report. report. <laughs> well, it's not a bad idea. If they sign up for a, P, for a P2 or whatever, whatever yeah. Yeah. it's a privilege account. For the, for the first month, it's seven dollars more, and then it's a maintenance fee that's less. It's actually a very good idea. Maybe scope it down to P two tenants. You can absolutely, you can absolutely do that. But if you look at all the admin roles, we have about twenty million of them. Right now, right now. So, so twenty million and in yeah, buy some stock first. Okay, it's just the scale problem is what we're talking about, right? Another yeah. one would be remove all the API um, on an API level. You, you can't actually do anything to any user who is uh, non MFA, MFA. No PowerShell, nothing like that. So, you all needs to be manually handled yeah. Yeah. for all users who are non MFA. Because then, all of a sudden, everyone would be MFA because you can't handle everything manually. Right? That's true. <laughs> That's true. Okay. That's true. Um, don't uh, don't allow any automation for any um, uh, non MFA user. Well, Octa's starting to look you, a whole lot better you. all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so our so our recommendation to automate, automate is, is service principles, service principles right? Move, move away from user using user account for scripting. scripting. Use service, use service principles, principles and have them um, with, a with a certificate. So you don't even use a strong password. You use a certificate that's on the device that is used to authenticate that service account. Um, so, so you're on breaks once a year, right? Just like your ADFS breaks once a year, your automation breaks once a year. How about this? The user, uh, the automated script has a username password, a default password that no one is paying, no one is monitoring. Um, no, but the target, and that, and the target object you're trying to manipulate. If that's a non MFA user, you should block the API calls and how to manipulate that thing. Because then you can't uh, you, you can't basically uh, manipulate. You, you, you can't handle those users effectively. You just have to use them, you know, uh, from a GUI or something like that. So. That's that's interesting. Interesting. I'm pretty sure I'll break most of our customers. Oh yeah, yeah. But for new features, all new yeah. features. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, no I, I agree. For new customers, we can enforce that in the And if a new feature, a user account, and a new feature without MFA. Should, should, should uh, force MFA, otherwise yeah. it's just period yeah. or manager. No, that makes sense. No, that makes for, sense. New for new tenants, for sure. For, sure. Um, for, um, existing, for existing, I think we have a big problem. The, also, the, the risk uh, levels, the high medium one, uh, we seem to have a lot of uh, false positive in there. And it's kind of like a black box that we can't modify the rules or anything, so it turns out we cannot really use it. Cause so, so the, the two there are two questions. One is, One is false, positives. false positives. So false positive, so false positive rate, rate is tied to the, tied to the risk level. level. So, based, so based on the risk level, level you'll see certain amount of false positive. False positive. For, high, for high, you'll see very low. Very low. Uh, we are uh, working on, working on um, a new machine learning model for user scoring, scoring and sign-in scoring. scoring. And those updates, and those updates should roll in, in um, later this month as part of the identity protection public preview, which will reduce the false positive machine as well. Which is not true at all. This is just not good. They're using, they're using VPNs or whatnot. So, so for the VPN, for the VPN solution, solution, one thing you can do is to configure name locations 
where, where if you can, if you define, can your define your organization's IP address our, in our um, uh, 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 Azure AD, you can reduce, we can reduce, yeah. Yeah. We can reduce, we can reduce all, all the false positives that are coming from your location. Why that doesn't work. You can't set that into black box. You know, in, you know, some, in some ways, we can't even tell why uh, the, user uh, the user is at risk. Like, like, as we keep working, keep working on our machine learning algos, that, that looks at over 100 data points. And it's, and it's even hard even for the data scientists to figure out what exactly was flagged. So it requires them to investigate that user manually to actually tell us what went wrong. So it's not just you who's facing this. It's just how um, machine learning is. It is a black box. Um, we just need to trust it. And um, Skynet <laughs> told me it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that does um, sound a little sketchy, though. So that we wrote some code that's telling us things, but we don't know exactly why, but we're going to leave it in. This is how we should learn the words. Well, I understand. You're questioning, I questioning them. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. This is why we have nothing to fear from our robot overlords. <laughs> <laughs> is this a free feature to all customers? Which one? Which one? Secure score, secure score, is, score is available for all customers, for all customers. whether it be, whether it be free Azure AD customers, customers, or customers or premium. Question. Question. So in the machine learning model that you're using to score that risk, once the user does sign in, so let's say the policy says it, it's scored high, but we let them in anyway, or we, MF, we set them up or whatever, does the result of that sign in and then the future behavior of that user feed back into the algorithm? It does. So it does. If so if you actually signed in from, let's take new location, new location right, right, from, from maybe Japan tomorrow, and you completed, and you completed MFA, successfully MFA successfully for that sign in, we'll understand, we'll understand that, that it's you actually, actually who's signing in from Japan. Japan. So, so going forward, that, that won't be flagged, and every time you won't be prompted for MFA or password change in Japan. So, just, so taking just taking a concrete example to make it clear, but yes, the user behavior and the fact that you've actually proven your identity actually feeds back. Then why isn't he seeing his VPN false positives go down over time? He hasn't, he hasn't enabled, enabled any of the policies as my presumption. No, because they're all over. So the thing is, it's a chicken and egg problem as well. Uh, unless you enable the policies, there's no, there's no way for us to get the feedback loop that this is actually good sign in activity for your tenant. In some ways, that's, some ways, that's the way to clean up the data as well going forward. Going forward. Um, um, the next thing, the next is, thing is automating threat response. response. So, so as, I as I mentioned earlier, sign-in risk, risk policy and user risk policy, you can actually, you can actually uh, take, take automatic action, action require MFA, MFA require, password require password change automatic automatically without requiring IT or help desk to intervene. Reducing your, reducing your attack surface is critical. Having fewer administrative accounts goes a long way. Our magic number is five. Disabling accounts that are not used, good cleanup. Most people don't do it. Um, next is, next is blocking, legacy blocking legacy authentication. authentication. It's daunting, it's daunting at, first, at first, but if you slowly approach the problem and break it down, and break it down you can achieve, achieve it. We know a bunch of large customers have, have done it in their environment as well. As well. Um, use um, non-global admin, admin roles um, as much as, as possible. possible. There are, there like, are 20 like 20 directory roles with different, uh, levels, with different of levels of permissions. Try to, try to leverage them. them. Global admins have far, far too much permissions than your IT team needs. Like every member of the IT team needs. Um, the next, um, the next recommendation, recommendation is around consent, app consent, um, which, um, is which is to not to allow not granting and user, user consent. Um, that's in light that's in of the recent, the recent um, app consent, app consent attacks, that attacks that we have seen. Um, the next, the next set of recommendations are strengthen your. Can you say more about the app consent? Yeah, so, yeah, so um, have you heard about the, the I, I don't know which name to mention, name to mention. This, is this is challenging, but, um, but um, I don't want to name names, but, uh, but uh, the, premise uh, the premise here is, here is you get an, you get an, um, an email, an email with a link to an app, and you're like, oh, oh yeah, I'm, oh, so, yeah, excited I'm so excited to use this app, app. it's going to give me free money, you click, on you it. click on it, then the app, then says, the app hey, says, hey, you have to consent, you have to you give all your data to me, and I can and do all the right, all the right things, things within the app, within the app. I, can I can get your out of emails, I can write emails on your behalf, whatever, and then the users, they don't understand what the app is asking for, and what they say is, yes, do it, give me free money. 
And then, and now, then the now the app has, has permissions to access your data, data to write on your behalf, behalf um, which, um, which we have seen has happened, happened in the past. I think the industry term is consent phishing, but I'm not. It's, it's also, also called as co-op abuse. abuse. Yes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> App consent App tissue, tissue co-op abuse, abuse, however you know about it. Um, one, of the one of the solutions is to not allow any use of consent to mitigate, to mitigate that problem. Strengthening your Strengthening credentials, your credentials um, I, don't I don't think I need to repeat this. Spam talked about, Pam talked about passwordless, password bunch of people, password people password talked about passwordless. We want to move away from passwords and, and rely on something stronger, stronger uh, like the FIDO keys, um, window has, uh, Windows Hello for business, so and so on. So, so if you can, if you can move, away move away from password, or at least start coming up with a roadmap to move away from passwords, right? It's going to be a long journey. In the meantime, stop expiring passwords. Um, they're, not um, they're not helping you, they're, helping you, they're hurting you. Turn on, turn on password hash synchronization. Enable, enable MFA for your users. I, I, saw, I, I saw someone's slide earlier, earlier today where they said MFA, MFA, MFA. 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 I think it was Michael it was again. Michael again. <laughs> Loved, your, Loved content. your content. <laughs> um, <laughs> you really, need, you really MFA. need MFA. The next thing, the is, next thing for is for any of the policies, of the policies to work that uh, you, you need users to be registered for multi-factor authentication. So going back to the password change scenario, we need to first validate that this is Gil before we can allow him to change his password. So we need users to be registered for multi-factor authentication. The next thing is to enable self-help for more predictable and complete end-user behavior. Um, the more you restrict your users, they'll come up with workarounds to get around the problem. Especially like passive reset, right? Like you, like you call help desk, you come up with all the excuses and um, that can be social engineered. So wouldn't it be better if end users could prove the identity using MFA or something you believe is strong and change the password on their own rather than calling help desk? You can pull, you can pull all this data into your favorite, your favorite team system, system and, and um, also you also can, you can um, use delegated CSP, CSP access. access. Did you get the photo? Did you get the photo? Okay. okay. So I want to so quickly, quickly run through, through um, what Secure Score, score provides, you. provides you. So it gives you a so score for your organization. So here you can see your 71 out of 248. 248 here indicates the maximum score that you can get by deploying all the Microsoft security recommendations. Uh, for, you to for you to help benchmark, benchmark your against number against the rest, the rest in the world. We have two, we different, have scores. two different scores. We have the industry average, average. So, you so you can understand that this is how financial, financial industry is doing. So financial industry in this case might have uh, 52, uh, 52 and I'm doing 71. Great, Great. I, should I should go pat my back. Um, the next thing, the we, next thing we have is, is um, typical, typical customer, customer size. size. <laughs> So again, so again, a way for you to understand <laughs> how you are doing as compared to the rest in the industry. On the, on the, huh? Yes, demo tenants. On the right is a trend chart, uh, which, shows uh, which shows you your secure, secure score over time. time. One, One amazing, amazing use case for that is showing progress, progress, progress to your management. management. Where, where you deploy, you deploy a, security a security capability, capability and all you and hear is complaints and you're just complaining, hey, uh, productivity uh, my productivity has gone down, I'm getting a lot of doubts. But this is one way for you to show that this is actually the security improvement you've made in your organization. So here you see a spike. So you can say, I deployed this capability and now the secure score has gone up from 50 to 8. So that's a way for you to showcase progress to your management and show how you've improved the security posture for your company. The next section the is the crux of it, where you can see all the recommendations. For each, for each recommendation, we have a security impact. impact. And, this is and this is actually done based on analysis, analysis on real data. data. So, we so we know that, that sign-in risk policy can reduce compromises by 96%. We know that, we know that um, blocking legacy ops can reduce compromises by 66%. And all that compromise rate analysis feeds into the scoring. Then we, have the, then we have the user impact and, and the implementation cost, cost which, which is based, is based on, on customer, customer input. input. So, so for each for recommendation, each recommendation we can tell you how will it impact, will it impact your end users, how much cost, how much cost it, is it is for you to deploy this capability. So, so as you see MFA for admin roles, admin roles it's low impact, it's low impact and low cost because, and low cost because 
it's only the, it's IT, only the IT team that's, that's impacted, it's not all your users. And it's, and easier, it's to easier to deploy because, because IT, team IT team is more tech savvy, savvy and, and they are more open to friction, friction than, your users. than your users. Well, they complain more. <laughs> 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 but they do. Um, um, all right, with that. All right, with that um, um, we can, we can take, take any take questions, any feedback. Any feedback. We have 10 minutes for questions. Someone in one of my sessions was talking about uh, the what they considered to be um, ambiguous message for password changes. Mm. Uh, they used a common password. I don't remember who that was, but I wanted to make sure that they could get that feedback. Does anyone else feel that the, the message that was displayed, sorry that, We've, we've, seen, seen, this we've seen this password too many times. Too many times. Or we've oh. seen that password before too many times. Is that no, I think it's just for on-prem. For on-prem, password right. doesn't meet the complexity required. Right, so that's what it's for on-prem. Okay. Okay. So you, uh, so you, uh, the, feedback the feedback was around on-prem and not cloud. Well, actually, there were two. There was, well, yeah, okay. they were both. They were both addressed. So the problem since Windows 2000 has been that any uh, refusal by a password filter for a new password results in the same message, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it always says this password doesn't meet complexity requirements and then it throws up a generic yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. complex yeah. password, right? So the concern was if you're using password protection and a known word is used, you're gonna get that same message and the user's not gonna be able to tell that, hey, I put in something that had uppercase, lowercase, yeah. yeah. et cetera, right? So um, that was the original comment. And then the follow-up was that it's slightly better if you're changing your password online, but still doesn't really help the user understand exactly what's wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the first, so the one, first one, one definitely, is, definitely an is an issue, and we should go back and address it. The second one, the I want to dig deeper. deeper. So, so the current, the current error, error message is you've seen, seen this password too many times. Too many times. With, With, or something, along, something those along those lines. Which indicates, Which that, indicates this that this is a common password. password. Do you guys feel you, guys feel you need to reword this? this? To be more clear, clear that, 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 that message actually sounds like you've used this password too many times. Yeah, that's what it sounds Got like. It. Got it. Yeah. As yeah. opposed that's to interesting. you've seen it out, yeah. out yeah. there. I mean, perhaps in big red letters, you could put the word that you didn't like and say, the word that you put in is on our list of bad words. Hey, hey, the, the, next word. attack the next attack we see, we try yeah. to yeah. call the words. <laughs> Um, but, but definitely, definitely well, let's good feedback that we could say something around. We have this is a very, common, is a very common commonly used password. Yeah, to be very clear. Yeah. Yeah. If I understand right, the, the problem on prem was that, that we don't really have an API tie in there, so we're just using the existing API. That's right. That's, that's my. Right, my that's right, um, well, it's the password mm -hmm. filter, right? And it's any response from any password filter, regardless of well, who wrote the password filter. Response. So the request from long past has always been, please allow us to customize the message when password right. filter is password password So it's nothing, so it's to, do nothing to do with the yeah. hand password kit. But, but it gets worse now because not only are we getting killed for complex password, we're getting killed for well-known passwords. And we have no way to communicate that to the user yeah. at the yeah. time that yeah. makes the change to change. Makes sense. Makes sense. Could you use the new plugins that are available that puts the self-service password reset URL on the login screen? There's that's a relatively new capability. Windows 10 all the way back to Windows 7, I think. And then okay. use that, you know, instead of the traditional control delete change password. Use that URL, which and maybe there's more flexibility to give better, better uh, guidance. Yeah, so yeah. That so that URL could point to a yeah. documentation which explains exactly this is how we evaluate your password. Interesting suggestion. Interesting suggestion. I'll have to look into how the yeah. URL works. works. Yeah, right. Any other feedback? Any other feedback? Uh, question. Is it yeah. still possible to have a Microsoft account in the global admins list? Um, because there used to be that scenario that the person that created the Azure AD tenant uh, did that with his personal Microsoft account and then left the company. Is there anything that's alerting on, on that? So, so um, uh, could, be back. could be back. We have, we have a 
break glass account white paper, paper which talks about removing any Microsoft, Microsoft accounts from your uh, directory yeah. uh, for admin uh, access, access. But, it's but it's not in the secure, in the secure score yet. Okay. So, so that's, that's a recommendation that we want to pull into yeah. the secure score. Yeah, we'll recommend that. Yeah. It's mentioned, it's in, mentioned the white in the white paper if you're yeah. I, I thought I saw something about you know using third party vendors like the MFA score. If you're not using ADFS, how do you get to, to say that I'm using a third yeah. party vendor? Yeah. Um, I don't have it. I don't have it in the screenshot. I could demo it. I could demo but, it but so if you so go into each, each, each of the recommendations, you can actually, you can actually mark, the mark the recommendation as third party. As third party. So, so if you're using third party, third party MFA solutions, or you're using or you're another, another MCAS solution, solution, or another way, another way to achieve the same uh, recommendation, uh, recommendation, you can mark, you can mark it, as it as third party and get points. And and the second, and thing, the second thing you can do is to ignore a recommendation as well. As well. In, case in case that recommendation doesn't, doesn't apply, apply to your organization for genuine, for genuine reasons, you can ignore, you can ignore the, the recommendation and that, and that is, is taken, out, taken from out from your scoring. So those are the so two ways for you to customize the score. score. So you could conceptually actually ignore all of them. <laughs> yes, you have yes, discussed, discussed that internally. <laughs> we have discussed, we have discussed that, that internally. <laughs> zero, out zero out of zero <laughs> is, what is what you get. So, so then you guys will come along with machine learning that'll that'll figure out the people that have artificially inflated their score and. We have discussed, we have discussed that. that. Our, <laughs> our, our initial, initial approach is very simple. Very simple. How, can How can we surface all the ignore controls here? In a way that, a way if, that if someone else is viewing this number, this number they, can they can identify that, that hey, there are, hey, there are some recommendations, recommendations that we have outright ignored. So, so it's more about, it's more about just driving visibility that your IT admin has ignored some, some stuff. Really you should go revisit it. It's like 71 out of 248 310. Yeah, or like, yeah, bracket, or like bracket, five, five controls, controls ignored, ignored, 50 points ignored. So the question is, what, what else was discussed here? <laughs> 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 what you discussed these are all, all ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, is there a way that when you ignore something, when you ignore a recommendation, that you could provide a justification so that, in essence, it's self-documenting, hmm. so that when someone does want to, because I could see this becoming very well a new part of the audit. Yep. That when yep. the auditor comes in, we're going to check this, and OK, great, you've got a great score. Now well, let's double check a couple of things. What have you ignored? OK, why did you ignore it? And so we'll pick three of the 10 recommendations you ignored at random. We'll look at your justification. We'll double check it. We'll see if it makes sense. That's a, that's a ask, that ask that I've got before, and it's in the backlog, it's in the backlog uh, that, uh, we that we should allow customers to provide notes when they ignore the recommendations, or, or, even, or even mark it as third party so they can log that, that they're using a third party product. Just to something similar in AD Rep, you could go into recommendations and explain why you didn't do it the way Microsoft wants you to do it, and yeah. put your notes in. Exactly. exactly, for reference right. back. Yeah. I think it has to still be stored because, like, for example, we use a third party. Uh, so we get scored pretty harshly. Um, but I don't think it would necessarily be fair to be like, yes, we have some with the IP, so we are now going to ignore that control. Because I know it's not, there are edge cases in which MFA is not being used. Okay. So it's like, yeah, I, I feel like it would be inaccurate to say that we can safely ignore the control. Even though we do have MFA globally deployed for all users, yeah. it's just yeah. like, I feel like it would not, be on the same standard as what you're looking at with your scores. Yeah. So, so, would you so there, so there are two things. Treat this like Microsoft MFA or something like that? Is that, is that, how would that no, I'm just saying, like, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to think of how you would do the scoring when you say third party. Like, do you get the full points? You do. You do. Yeah, so, I think it's honor system. So, you, so you will, be responsible, will be responsible for making sure, for making that, sure that, that you have MFA for all cases. All cases. And then you, then you should go and say market as third party. It's mostly on our system. We rely on IT admins to do the right thing. And if you know there are corner cases and you're just doing this to get points, that's something wrong in that. One question. One question there. Thank you, Mayor, for pointing this out. Um, all these features that turn on are free, correct? <coughs> Like the MFA for Azure AD privilege rules enable risk policy 
All is a very big story. Secure score is free. Secure score is available for all customers, which is what Brian was asking earlier. So any customer can go to Secure score and see all the information. Does it cost like the fee for it, or is it like the implementation impact, user impact, score impact? So implementation cost doesn't mean the dollars. It means the IT resources, like how much time do you have to spend to deploy this capability. Are there any internal discussions around making more of the conditional access capabilities available to not P2 subscribers? To non P1 subscribers? To non P2. So Azure AD P2, there are certain conditional access policies on remembering correctly that you can only do if you have Azure AD P2. Yes. Yeah, so the risk based the policies, are policies are P2. Rest of conditional, rest of conditional access, access is P1. Is P1. Um, we will be rolling, will be rolling out baseline protection, baseline protection will which will give you some capabilities, capabilities and no additional cost. Um, um, but broadly, broadly there's, there's no discussion of making those free. Bam. Bam. So, People actually get 248 out of 248. Have you guys like, done the, the, the I'm yet to, I'm yet to meet a customer with that score. That's the highest score that I've seen. Just ignore them all. Yeah, exactly. I've seen, I've seen fairly, fairly high scores. High scores. I, don't I don't remember the max, the max but I've seen like, I've seen, like certain, customer certain customer size, size having a score of 160. How about over 200? The actual, the actual product, product has 221. The screenshot was taken when we were. <laughs> in preview mode. What about your demo tenant? Um, <laughs> it's it's high. high. Yeah. <laughs> now. Now. <laughs> now. And the goal is, and the goal not, is not to get to the perfect score, right? Like, right? It's, not like, it's not like you have to go to 100%. Yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, what are you saying? <laughs> I mean, some, I mean, some of us are competitive, but, but I have a, I have a colleague who's like, hey, why are you not giving me points for this? I've done it, I've done it. And he's just doing this in his test environment, and he's like, I can't show this to my customers unless I have a perfect score. <laughs> I mean, technically, if your whole justification is that you want something cool to show management that we can succeed, don't make it impossible for me to get above a 60% because that would be awkward. You know, where you're like, hey, look at what all we did, but uh, based on my talk in 2018, I'm not going to get above 160, so we can calm down now. <laughs> So, so I think 160, I think 160 the, number the number is low because we haven't pushed, we haven't pushed this, right? We released this at night, and, and it's, it's, we, haven't we haven't given customers enough time to improve this security posture. Um, I've had a customer who came to me at Ignite and said, yeah, I'm going to get, yeah, my, gonna Microsoft get my Microsoft Secure Score up to 600, 600 out of 8,800 at that point. And so, and so more and more customers are looking at the score and they're trying to push their numbers for the best for the organization. For the win, yeah. That's one of, That's the, side one of the side effects of having a number. <laughs> <laughs> you have a website that shows all the admins and the scores that they've achieved this week. Boy, you see some high scores. We have internally, internally, internally discussed having, having like our customer, customer experience team comparing, comparing their scores. And, and the customer experience folks are pretty competitive and oh, they need, oh, I need to get a better score than you. It should be linked to your LinkedIn. <laughs> I, have I have the best track record of getting customer secure. Question. Question. Well, you could just offer a subscription discount if your score is over a certain number. Yeah, we have been brainstorming cool, cool ideas, ideas on, on how we can incentivize, incentivize, incentivize or actually um, reward customers for actually getting to a better well, that's 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 three months. Months. You know, yeah. linking it to my LinkedIn profile sounds like a, a consent attack. Uh, we might give, we you, might a give you a badge. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right, we are out of time. <laughs> you can have the you can have the company scores claim in uh, in your token, so. When you drop down, you don't know, you lose access. That'll be that'll be that's a good, good idea. That's, that's good. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea for us. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Any questions? Other questions? Last question. Last question.
I'm gonna create, I'm gonna a, create a survey where everyone, everyone can post their idea for the first one. It's very interesting. We're just starting on this, but I think we can use this as a tool to drive more awareness, more customers to a better is our goal. All right, we are, All right, out, we are time, out of time, so, so I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> Sure, sure. 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 S